Hi, I'm Ian Gunn, CEO and Battlefield Historian at In The Footsteps. And I'm Tony Smith, Battlefield Historian within The Footsteps and their resident guide in Cornwall. We would like to welcome you to this video looking at the English Civil Wars battlefield centred around the town of Lostwithiel in Cornwall. Lostwithiel is one of those much overlooked battlefields in the United Kingdom and it's the site of a significant battle in the English Civil Wars. It was King Charles I's last major victory in the First English Civil War and Parliament's greatest defeat. And it, along with the failure to defeat King Charles at the Second Battle of Newbury, ultimately led to the creation of the New Model Army. Tony and I recently visited the battlefield and we'd love to share it with you. Tony, before we begin, can you tell us something about the events that led to the Battle of Lostwithiel? Indeed. The English Civil Wars between King and Parliament lasted nearly nine years. They began on the 22nd of August 1642 when King Charles I raised his standard at Nottingham and they ended with the defeat of his son Charles at the Battle of Worcester on the 3rd of September 1651. Now in Cornwall, MPs and the major landowners were divided as to which side to support. Some were for the Crown through the institution of the Duchy of Cornwall, others for Parliament, particularly in South East Cornwall. Both sought the right to raise a militia to fight for their cause. The lesser gentry, the yeoman farmers, the bulk of the Cornish were very firmly for the king. Among the notable royalists were Sir Bevel Grenville of Stowe, Jonathan Trelawney of Trelawney, John Trevanian of Care Hayes, Jonathan Rashley of Menabilly, Sir Francis Bassett of St. Michael's Mount, Lord Mohan of Baconock, John Arundel of Trerice, and the Vivians of Trella Warren. Parliamentarians included Lord Robarts of Lanhydrock, John St. Auburn of Clowance, and Nicholas Boscowan of Trethgonan. As elsewhere in the country, as you might expect, some families were divided, including the Arundels, the Carews, and the Godolphins. Now, at the outbreak of the war, Sir Babel Grenville proclaimed the King's Commission of Array at Launceston Assizes, and he persuaded the Grand Jury of the Duchy to declare their opponents guilty of riot and unlawful assembly. In 1642, the Cornish Royalist Army was formed by Ralph Hopton, first Baron Hopton. And this army's first invasion of Devon took place November, December 1642, but actually ended in failure. It did, however, manage to secure the Cornish side of Plymouth Sound, which posed a serious problem for parliamentarian forces. Various sorties were made by the parliamentarians into the north of the duchy. There were skirmishes and battles, such as the Battle of Windmill Hill on the southern edge of Launceston. At the start of 1643, the royalist position in Cornwall was threatened by advance from Devon of two parliamentary armies, one under Henry Gray, the first Earl of Stamford, and Colonel Ruthin, the parliamentary governor of Plymouth, led the second. Now, Hopton and Grenville decided to strike at Ruthin before he could join forces with Stamford. Hopton found the parliamentarians deployed on Braddock Down, which is midway between Los Withiel and Liscard on the 19th of January, 1643. He threw his troops into a furious charge which overwhelmed the enemy. Rithin's men fired barely a single volley at the advancing royalists. And between 1,250 and 1,500 parliamentarians were captured together with their baggage train and ammunition and as many as 200 were killed. So now Cornwall was once more firmly in the hands of the Royalists. Hopton marched into Devon and resumed the siege of Plymouth with his forces occupying the surrounding towns to really seal the city off from the land. The Battle of Braddock Down had rejuvenated the Cornish army and confirmed their faith in Hopton's leadership. Later in the year, parliamentarians led by the Earl of Stamford moved into North Cornwall and they took up a strong position at a place called Stratton, which is near Bude. On the 16th of May, 1643, the Battle of Stratton took place and local knowledge of the terrain enabled Hopton to mount a surprise dawn attack on Stamford's position. The Royalists defeated the parliamentarians, leaving 300 dead on the field and taking 1,700 prisoners. In early 1644, Lyme, which is now called Lyme Regis, was acting as a base for parliamentary operations against the Royalists in the southwest. Prince Morris, the king's nephew and younger brother of Prince Rupert, was instructed to besiege the town, which he duly did in April 1644. Lyme, however, proved pretty resilient 
and his efforts uh, were rebuffed and he was still there in mid-June. In the first year of the war, Cornwall and much of the west of England and Wales were royalist strongholds. Plymouth was one exception and Plymouth remained in parliamentary hands throughout the conflict. The south and east of England were largely controlled by Parliament. The land between the two, the Midlands, was the most fought over and the major battles of Edgehill, Oxford, Newbury, Marston Moor and Naseby were all fought in this area. At the same time, Parliament is trialling a new strategy. Previously, it had three separate armies in the field in southern and central England. The primary force was under Robert Devereux, the Earl of Essex. But two other armies, the Eastern Association under Edward Montague, Earl of Manchester, and a further army under Sir William Waller were engaged in operations in Lincolnshire and Hampshire, respectively. Whilst Manchester could not be released from Lincolnshire, the forces of Essex and Waller were combined and tasked against the Royalists surrounding Oxford. This initially met with success and the King was forced to withdraw his troops from both Reading and Abingdon in the face of new threat. However, relations between the two commanders of the combined army were poor and when Waller pursued the King towards Worcester, Essex didn't follow. On 6th of June 1644, he abandoned his Oxford campaign and moved to the southwest to relieve Lyme. Essex made fast progress and by 15th of June 1644, he was at Blandford, prompting Prince Morris to lift the siege around Lyme and pull back to Exeter. Essex followed, forcing Morris to retreat even further west. Morris hoped that Essex would pause his advance and besiege Exeter, but instead the parliamentarians continued in pursuit, bypassing the town. The Royalist cause in the south was now in chaos as Essex advance forced the local Royalist commander, Sir Richard Grenville, he was the younger brother of Sir Bevel, who had been killed at the Battle of Lansdowne in 1643, to abandon his siege of, siege of Plymouth, which was the only other significant parliamentarian garrison in the southwest. Essex now hoped that with the support from the Plymouth garrison and local recruits, he could wrest control of the southwest from the Royalists and cut off the supplies of Cornish tin that financed their war effort. So, having lifted the sieges of Lim and Plymouth, the Earl of Essex decided to invade Cornwall. So what happened next? Well, Essex entered Cornwall on the 26th of July at Horsebridge, and he arrived in Bodmin a few days later. But his plan was already unravelling. Cornwall failed to show much enthusiasm for Parliament, whilst a significant Royalist force, having defeated Sir William Waller's army at the Battle of Cropredy Bridge, had already been sent from Evesham to supplement Prince Morris's forces. This new force was commanded by King Charles himself. The King and his army arrived in Exeter on the 26th of July, the same day that Essex entered Cornwall. And this new Royalist army therefore effectively cut off the parliamentarian's landward line of withdrawal. On the 2nd of August, the Earl of Essex marched his parliamentarian army away from Bodmin towards Lost Withiel and sent a force further south to secure the port of Foy to ensure communications with the fleet of the Earl of Warwick. On the 3rd, Charles ordered Sir Richard Grenville to move up eastwards from Prenryn to Tregony to disrupt Essex's foraging parties to the west, thus depriving his army of much needed supplies. On the 4th of August, Essex informs the committee of both kingdoms the situation he's in and that he expects to be attacked on both sides. He hopes to hold Lost Withiel until enough provisions could be sent from Plymouth by sea to enable him to move. I'm going to read a piece now of his letter that shows just the situation he was in. He writes, we now hear that three armies are marching against us from the east under the commands of the King, of the Palgrave Morris and Lord Hopton, while nobody so far as we can hear are attending on them and the country rising unanimously against us with the exception of a few gentlemen. We must expect another army upon our backs from the West. This prospect with the great necessity of the soldiers who want bread has forced me to choose this place to make good till we can be befrided with victuals from Plymouth or hereabouts to enable us to march. Then we shall sell our lives as a dear a rate as may be for I have never seen soldiers more willing to undertake anything nor to undergo wants with more patience. On the 9th, the King moved forward and established his headquarters at Baconic House on the east side of the River Foy. This remained the royal headquarters for the rest of the campaign and elements of his army camped in the parks around. 
On the 10th of August, Sir Richard Grenville arrived at Brodmin and he drove out the parliamentarian horse that had been camped there. By the 11th of August, the parliamentarian army was boxed in around Loswithiel. Sir Richard Grenville had secured Bodmin to the north and a line of royalist outposts ran from Grand Pound to Bodmin and southwards to Baconic and on upwards to Liscard. The King continued to press west. The King with Prince Morris's force was able to meet up and combine with the Cornish forces of Grenville. The royalist forces now opposing the Earl of Essex's 10,000 parliamentarians consisted of 12,000 foot and 7,000 horse. The scene was now set for the battle. Who would be the principal commanders? On the royalist side, there were three armies, as said, the Oxford army under the King, Prince Morris's Western army that had been besieging Lyme, and Sir Richard Grenville's Cornish army, a total force of around 19,000 men. The parliamentarian army under Richard Devereux, the Earl of Essex, had Sir William Balfour commanded the cavalry and Sergeant Major General Philip Skippen commanded the foot. He also had the complicated duty of arranging the line of battle. Tony. Thank you for telling us about the events that led to the Battle of Lost Withiel. Before we set off on our tour, what are the locations we are going to be visiting? There are nine locations or stands we're going to be visiting on the tour. And these are Lanhydrock House, Resprin Bridge, Restormal Castle, St. Necton's Church. We're going to the town of Lost Withiel where we'll visit St. Bartholomew's Church, the Duchy Palace and Lost Withiel Bridge. And then we'll carry on towards a place called Cliff, and we'll visit Budinic, Polruin Castle, and Castle Door. So the Earl of Essex withdrew south from Bodmin with the intention of withdrawing his forces by sea from Foy. The first stand of our tour is at Lanhydrock House, which lies at the northern end of the battlefield. Tony, why is Lanhydrock House so important? Well, Lanhydrock House was the home of Lord Robarts, and it was from there that he and Essex were forced to withdraw in the face of the advancing Royalist army. When you go there, unfortunately, only the gatehouse, the two-storey porch and the North Range, which has got a 116-foot-long gallery, remain from the Civil War period. Because unfortunately, in 1881, there was a fire and the house was rebuilt. As we'll discuss later, the house itself became the HQ of Royalist Sir Richard Grenville during the battle. It's a good place to meet up, it's got car parking and toilet facilities there, so it's, it's a good place to start the tour. Okay, so following the withdrawal from Bodmin, Essex established a defensive line on the 2nd of August covering Lost Withiel, the town, the ruined Restormal Castle just to the north, which was garrisoned by Colonel John Weir's Devonshire Regiment, and he had outposts of foot who were posted on either side of the town, particularly to the north and east uh, on a couple of hills, one called Druids Hill and Beacon Hill. His frontline army consisted of some 7,000 foot and 2,500 and horse under the command of Sir William Balfour, and they were quartered in Lost Withiel itself. He also sent 1,000 foot down to secure the port of Foy. We have dropped down into the river valley to the east of Lanhydrock House and are now at Resprin Bridge. What happened here that makes it important to the battle? Okay, as we've heard, on the 11th of August 1644, Sir Richard Grenville with 2,400 men seized Bodmin. He then continued to secure Resprin Bridge after the parliamentary forlorn hope that was there abandoned the site, having been under constant pressure and were at great risk of being cut off from the army. By now, the King with the Oxford Army and Prince Morris with the Western Army were closing in from the east. The following day, Sir Richard Grenville occupied Lanhydrock House, which we've seen was the, the home of Lord Robarts. That is tightening now the Royalist hold on the northern end of the battlefield. Now the house remains his HQ for the rest of the campaign. On the 13th of August, the Royalist horse also secure a ford at Penpole Creek, St. Viet, this is to the south enabling the capture of one of Lord Bohan's houses, Hall House, close to the Bodonic Ferry. They then took possession of the fort at Pole Ruin, effectively commanding the entrance to the Foy Harbour. They garrisoned the fort with 200 foot and three guns. And by doing that, they effectively prevented the use of the port by the Parliamentarian Navy. This aerial clip of Resperin Bridge shows just how narrow it is. Its seizure was advantageous to the Royalist forces 
as it enabled them to operate on both sides of the River Foy. We have followed the River Foy south from Restburn Bridge and are now at Restamall Castle. Tony, can you tell us what happened here? Well, on the 21st of August, the King began his attack against the Earl of Essex's force at Lothswithiel. At about 7 a.m., Sir Richard Grenville, with 700 men or so, attacked Restormal Castle, and the garrison of just 30 men there of Weir's regiment put up scant resistance, as you might expect, and they abandoned their position. The Royalists also took the nearby ford, giving them yet another crossing point over the River Foy. Now, Restormal was the anchor of the left wing of the parliamentarian line, so its loss punched a major hole in the line of defence. Later in the day, Essex forces attempted to recapture the castle and there was heavy fighting which pushed back the Royalist lines. Positions, though, were established when charges from bodies of Royalist horse under Lieutenant Colonel Sir Robert Walsh and Major James Smith of Colonel Sir George Vaughan's regiment of horse threw the Essex men back. Within the castle itself, it's derelict, it appears that the chapel was pressed into service as a gun emplacement. It overlooks the river valley and the ford and perhaps the gatehouse there actually served as accommodation. When you go there, it's an excellent spot on which to get a view over to Beacon Hill and Druids Hill, two key hills in the defence lines. In this aerial clip, you see the Lostwithiel battlefield from the area that was held by the parliamentarian forces deployed to the east of the River Foy and to the north of Lostwithiel. It pans from Druids Hill and along the tree-covered ridge that was occupied by the Parliamentarian Centre to Beacon Hill, before dropping down and across the valley to Lostwithiel. The church by which we are standing is St Nectons, to the east of Lostwithiel and close to Beacon Hill, which was the right-hand end of the Parliamentarian Army's defensive line. Tony, what happened in this area? Well, as I've said, on the 21st of August, King Charles's army and Prince Morris's force attacked from the east. The Earl of Brentford's Oxford foot captured Beacon Hill, the parliamentarians offering little resistance, and they withdrew back towards Los Withiel. Prince Morris's royalist force occupied neighbouring Druids Hill with a similar ease and cleared the high ground to the north of the Liscard Road. Casualties were relatively few, and by nightfall, the fighting ended with the royalists now holding the high ground to the north and east of Los Withiel. That night, they set up a 20 square yard redoubt on Beacon Hill, placing guns there to bombard the town of Lost Withiel. A note from the time notes, some pieces of cannon were planted that shot into the parliamentarian quarters and did them great harm when their cannon, though they returned 20 shot for one, did very little or no harm. Now, the spire of St. Nectan's Church, you see from the video here, is a little strange because it was destroyed by parliamentarian artillery during the fighting. It suggests that the church was actually a jumping off point for the Royalist attack. Indeed, the Oxford foot had an outpost here before the attack actually started. In this aerial clip, you see a 360 degree view of the battlefield taken from a spot between Beacon Hill and St. Nectan's Church. It pans from Beacon Hill across the valley to the northern flank and then on to Druids Hill. From there, it pans over the more open fields across which the Royalist forces attacked, and then St. Nectan's Church, beyond which is Baconic, where King Charles set up his headquarters, before continuing to pan to return to Beacon Hill. We are now in Lospithiel at St. Bartholomew's Church, which features in the story of the battle. Wasn't there a christening and didn't the parliamentarians attempt to blow it up? That's right, the parliamentarian cavalry actually stabled their horses within the church and they held a mock ceremony and they took one of their horses and they christened it Charles, apparently in contempt of his sacred majesty. The font used for that christening is just by the east door. There were also a small number of royalist prisoners which they got, which they actually kept up in the belfry. Now, those prisoners, being clever fellows, pulled up the ladder and refused to come down. The parliamentarians tried to dislodge them in the first instance with musket fire and smoke, but when that failed, they actually exploded a barrel of gunpowder which lifted the roof, and the line of the roof as it was then can be seen under the latest spire. 
the Duchy Palace was used by the Earl of Essex as his headquarters during the fighting. What happened in the town after Beacon Hill had been captured by the Royalists? Well, as I said, they put a redoubt up on Beacon Hill and they started to bombard the town. Now, that bombardment from Beacon Hill reduced movement in the town and the town was actually severely damaged. In the fighting that followed, the Great Hall of the Stannery Palace, also known as the Duchy Palace, was sacked and burned, destroying valuable records of the Shire and the Stanneries. This building, the Exchequer Hall, was the least damaged. To look back in history a little, the Duchy Palace was a complex of buildings constructed in the late 13th century by the Earls of Cornwall as a centre for their administration. The Exchequer Hall was part of the Duchy Palace where taxes due on smelted tin were collected. It became ruinous in the 17th century, became a Freemason's temple in 1878 and actually then became redundant in 2008. And it was purchased then by the UK Historic Buildings Preservation Trust in 2009 and has been repaired and restored. Another general advance was planned for the 25th of August and half the Royalist cavalry was to be sent across the Resperin Bridge to reinforce Grenville. However, when it became clear that the parliamentarians were actually still firmly established in Lostwithiel, the advance was cancelled. On the 26th of August, the King sent 2,000 horse and Major General Sir Thomas Bassett along with 1,000 foot around the parliamentarian lines in the direction of St. Blasey to the west. This was to prevent the parliamentarians foraging in that direction and also to prevent them using the port of Par for any withdrawal. The Royalists were receiving, at this time, plentiful supplies of food and everything else, but Earl of Essex's force was beginning to seriously run low on food and other essential supplies. On the 30th of August, two deserters were brought to the King's headquarters at Buchanan, and they revealed that Essex was actually planning to retire to the coast with the infantry and guns, and that Balfour, the man in charge of the cavalry, was intending to break out with his cavalry. The King reacted promptly. Warnings were sent to Goring at St. Blasey and the Royalist detachments at St. Veep and Pole Ruin. A courier was also sent to Colonel Sir William Waldegrove at Saltash on the Tamar, ordering him to break down the bridges over the river. Fifty musketeers were also posted to a house on the Lostwithiel to Liscard Road. Uh, and the lifeguard of horse who were quartered at Lanreath were warned at about one in the morning on the 31st and they started to ride to Buchanan. However, despite these precautions, the parliamentarian cavalry escaped. At about 3 a.m., Balfour's column rode past the 50 musketeers without being engaged. Lord Cleveland managed to get 250 horse together, but this was just too small a force to stop Balfour. At dawn, Cleveland, now with 500 men, pursued the parliamentarians over Braddock Down, the scene of the previous battle years before, and the Carradon Down. Balfour shrugged off an attack by Waldegrave in Saltash and ferried his men over the Tamar, reaching Plymouth with a loss of only 100 men. The bridge over the River Foy was here at the time of the battle, but the end nearest the railway station is a later addition. Yeah, that's right. The water course has changed over time and the medieval bridge was extended by an additional four arches in the late 18th century. Until the town bypass were opened, this very narrow single lane bridge was the main road between St Austin and Liscard. And going over it today gives you an idea of the width of the roads at that time and the challenges of moving armies along them. When the parliamentarians withdrew from Lostwithiel, why didn't they destroy the bridge? Well, when Essex's main body began to leave Lostwithiel, as they pulled back down towards Foy, the King sent his royalist forces in hot pursuit. Now, the parliamentarians did attempt to destroy this bridge to delay that pursuit, but the demolition party sent to carry out the task was clearly visible to the royalists on Beacon Hill. And at 7am on the 31st of August, a thousand royalist foot advanced into the town before the demolition party had actually managed to complete their task, and they drove them off. The bridge remained standing and the Royalists crossed. Now Skippen, the parliamentarian commanding the rear guard in person, tried to hold the high ground to the south of the town to buy time for the army to retreat. The king then brought up his guns and bombarded the position and under this fire Skippen retreated southwards. The king himself rode from Beacon Hill at eight in the morning, crossed the foy by a ford just south of the town. By this stage it was obvious that the parliamentarian army was falling apart. The Royalists followed, keeping their opponents under unrelenting pressure. We are standing at a small beached area on the banks of the River Foy at Cliff. 
Tony, what is its connection to the English Civil Wars? Well, the tiny village of Cliff can be reached by some extremely narrow lanes, and really you shouldn't go anywhere near it in anything larger than a car. But by following the narrow road to the end, you come to a beach area, which has got a white cottage on the opposite side of the road. And built into the walls of the house, just above the windows, are two English Civil War cannonballs. Now, at the time of the Civil War, there was a narrow ford across the river here at this point, and the Royalists posted a guard to deny the crossing to the parliamentarians. Their camp was on the high ground above the cottage, and anecdotal evidence suggests that artefacts dating from the period have actually been recovered from that area. It was the Charles Lloyd's Regiment of Foot that were posted here, opposite the Goland Ferry, which is on the, on the parliamentarian side, if you like, on the 12th of August. The Royalists now held all the left bank of the foyer, and they controlled all the ferries and all the crossings, except for the bridge at Lost Withiel, which, as we saw in the previous stand, they finally took. Now, the positions here at Cliff and at Bodonic, a bit further south, prevented Essex from using the river for his supplies. It's tidal as far as Lost Withiel. And it forced him also to keep garrisons on the other side opposite these potential crossings to stop raiding parties or even the Royalists crossing in force, thus cutting off his access to Foy. So it's actually tying up his men all the way down the river. We've come to Bodnik. What happened here that connects it to the English Civil Wars? We were at Bodinic to visit the remains of Hall Chapel, as it was to Hall House that the King came during the encirclement of the Parliamentarians. Hall House is now a farm and private land, but the remains of its adjacent chapel can be visited by a short but hilly walk from Bodinic. The chapel can be reached by following the Hall Walk footpath, the start of which can be found on the right as you climb up the hill from the Bodinic Ferry. Follow the track to the War Memorial, cross over the nearby stile into a field and walk along the left-hand side to the back of the farm. The remains of the chapel are located just behind Hall Farm. It was near Hall House that a parliamentarian soldier on the far bank of the River Foy took a pot shot at King Charles on the 17th of August as the King was observing events across the river. The shot missed the King but killed a local fisherman who was standing nearby. A memorial plaque recording the attempt to shoot the king is further along the footpath from the war memorial at a shelter on the left at the end of the made-up path. We have come to Paul Ruin Castle, which stands on the eastern bank of the River Foy, close to where the river runs into the sea. What is its connection to the English Civil Wars and the Battle of Lost Withiel? Well, Paul Ruin Castle was where 200 royalist foot of Sir James Perryman's regiment of foot under the command of a Captain James Garraway with three guns were placed on the 13th of August. This fort controls the entrance to Foy Harbour and thus it effectively denied the Earl of Essex's forces an escape route by sea. And you can see the value of the position that they had here. The parliamentarians only made one attempt to force the mouth of the Foy to relieve Essex on the 26th of August. It failed. And it was admitted then that the loss of Foy Harbour being to our infinite disadvantage, no ship being able to ride out the command of their guns. It was a very strategic position to be held. We have crossed over the River Foy using the Bodnick Ferry and come to Castle Door. These earthworks date from between the 3rd and 1st centuries BC and in the 6th century AD, surrounded the hall of King Mark of Cornwall of Arthurian legend. What is its connection to the English Civil Wars and the Battle of Lost Withiel? Okay, so as we've heard, Essex's army set off down the narrow road heading towards Foy uh, when they started their withdrawal from Lost Withiel on the 31st of August 1644. They're heading for Foy, that is their escape route. Their column included their guns and a small body of infantry formed a rear guard to try and protect the withdrawal. An account of the withdrawal records that the, the ways were extreme foul with excessive rain and the harness for the draft horses so rotten as that in the marching off we lost three demi culverins and a brass piece. And yet the major general fought in the rear all day, he being loath to lose these pieces. 30 horses were put on each of them, but could not move them. The night was so foul and the soldiers so tired they could hardly be kept to their colours. In this aerial clip, you see the battlefield across which the Parliamentarian army withdrew on the 31st of August, 1644, hotly pursued by Richard Grenville's Cornish. It pans from the direction of Lostwithiel in the north and along the River Foy Valley before arriving at the site of the hill fort at Castle Door. 
Beyond Castle Door is the village of Goland and the ford guarded by the Royalists and the Colonel Lloyd at Cliff. The parliamentarians are pushed back hedge by hedge until their resistance thickened at a, a line between Tower Dreeth and the River Foy at Goland. As noted, King Charles himself had forded the river just south of Lost Withiel at eight in the morning, and he soon found evidence of the parliamentarian hasty and disorderly withdrawal. There was a cartload of muskets and five cannon abandoned in the mud as he, as he rode past. Now between 11 and 12, the parliamentarians deployed a blocking force upon Skippen Hill. The idea was to buy time for the remainder of their army to withdraw onto Castle Door and then form a defensive line. Grenville's men, the Royalists fell back, but rallied on the King's lifeguard afoot under the command of Lieutenant Colonel William Layton. The lifeguard of horse then charged the parliamentarian infantry, driving them from some of the hedges they held, despite them putting up fierce fire back. Major Brett leading the Queen's troop to the attack carried on regardless, despite himself being shot in the arm at the first hedge. As he rode back to have his wound dressed, he was knighted on the spot by the King. The main body of the Royalist foot came up at about two in the afternoon and Colonel Matthew Appleyard took the vanguard straight into the hedges. At the same time, Major General Bassett coming up from St. Blasey hit the parliamentarian left flank. There was still some fight left in the parliamentarian army. Captain Reynolds with three troops of horses, those that hadn't actually left with Balfour on the, on the retreat to Plymouth, counter-attacked, supported by Essex's own regiment of foot. The Royalists were driven back several fields, but the parliamentarians re withdrew as the lifeguard approached. Lord Goring arrived at 4 p.m. and was ordered to pursue Balfour, which he did. There was another parliamentary counter-attack at six o'clock but the arrival of the Earl of Northampton's cavalry helped turn it back. By early evening on the 31st of August, Castle Door formed the centre of the parliamentarian defence line with Essex's artillery in position on its ramparts. To the west of the rampart stood Essex's own regiment and Colonel Butler's musketeers. To the east stood Weir's, Bartlett's and Robart's regiments. There were too few men to hold a solid line from the river Foy to the coast, and so the flanks must inevitably have been turned. Weir's regiment disintegrated at nightfall, an utter defeat was only hours away. The Earl of Essex himself saw the end was coming at Castle Door and he left the conduct of the retreat to Sergeant Major General Philip Skippen, the commander of the foot. When Skippen asked for orders on the night of the 31st of August, 1st of September, he was told to try and bring the army to Melabilly and Polkeris to the west. Failing that, he was threatened to blow up his artillery train to try and secure the best possible surrender terms. Accompanied by Lord Robarts and Sir John Merrick, the Earl of Essex escaped by fishing boat to Plymouth just after dawn on the 1st of September. On the 2nd of September, the parliamentary army formally surrendered to the King at Foy. Officers above the rank of corporal were allowed to keep their arms and a convoy was provided for the able-bodied on the retreat to Los Withiel, Poole and Wareham. The sick and wounded were to be transported by sea from Foy to Plymouth. The retreat began in mid-afternoon in heavy rain. Richard Simmons watched each regiment pass. The rout of the soldiers pressed all of a heap like sheep, so dirty and dejected as was rare to see. None of them except a few of their officers that didn't look any of us in the face. One parliamentary soldier also wrote, we were inhumanly dealt with, abused, reviled, scorned, torn, kicked, pillaged, and many stripped of all they had, quite contrary to the articles. For even in the presence of their king and their generals, they took away our cloaks, coats and hats. When they reached Los Withiel, infuriated Cornish peasantry de deprived them of rations, clothes and boots. Many were naked and barefoot. They were exposed to the autumn rains. For three days, they marched without food or shelter until they reached Oakhampton, where the townsfolk were forced to sell them food at exorbitant rates. Of the 6,000 that left Foy, only 1,000 lived to make it to Pool. This ends our virtual tour of the Lost Withiel battlefield, and I would like to thank Tony for guiding us around. If you have found it enjoyable and useful, please leave a thumbs up and a comment. Thank you for watching, and we hope that you have enjoyed what you have seen. If you would like to visit the battlefield with Tony as your guide, please contact In the Footsteps to arrange your tour.